front lines. Men on the front lines. Men on the front lines. Men on the front lines. We call for these mighty men of valor. The Lord put a vision in my heart for a new movement amongst men in the body of Christ. The Lord says that I'm going to make champions out of those who would gather unto me. And I believe what men on the front lines will do. And I see it going into the nations. He's going to raise the bar among men. It's time for heroes to arise. I'm Robert Hodgkin, and this is Heroes Arise. Men on the Front Line social media broadcast, equipping, encouraging, and empowering you to arise as the hero, warrior, and champion that God created you to be. You matter, you are important, and you have a key role to play for the kingdom and the earth. So thanks for joining me again this week so we can continue to pour into you. And talk about continuing, this week we're doing part two of our prophetic pitfall series. And what we're looking at is we're looking at the traps the enemy lays to keep us from being effective in prophetic ministry. Because God always wants to use prophetic ministry. God's always speaking, God's always talking, and God wants to use you to not only hear from him, to help others hear from him as well. Because we not only hear his voice, we get to share his voice. So we're gonna talk about some more of the prophetic pitfalls that we need to be aware of so we don't get ensnared by the enemy and we can be discerning and effective in prophetic ministry. We're not here to point fingers, we're not here to cast blame. This is not about getting things that we can accuse others of. This is working with Holy Spirit so that he can help us be more effective in hearing from God and making God heard in the spheres of influence that we're called to. But just before we get into the next round of pitfalls, I've got a couple quick announcements for you. Mark your calendars, guys. March 24th through the 26th, we've got our Man Camp East Coast event in 2022. This is our national East Coast event. You want to be there. It's going to be another great weekend of brotherhood, breakthrough, and adventure. This is your chance to disconnect from the busyness of all that you got going on in your life and in your world and spend a great time in the great outdoors with a great group of guys and of course, the great I am. We're gonna help empower you to walk as the son of God and the man of God you've been created to be. You know, you want to bring all that you are and all that God's given you to all that you're called to and we're gonna have times of mentoring, times of teaching, times of ministry, great fellowship times, great worship, times and we've got a whole bunch of great adventure planned for you as well. We have the information and registration page up so you can find out all about the event. Just go to menonthefrontlines.com and click the events link. And just in case there's any problems with that or any interruptions in, in our service, email me, robert at menonthefrontlines.com and I'll get you all the information you need to be a part of the event. They're building an extra camp, uh, a cabin for us at the campgrounds, which is great, so we can take some more guys, but these events grow every single time we do them, and I think there's only room for about 100 guys, so you wanna make sure you secure your spot. All right, our other announcement is the announcement we have every single week, but we wanna make sure you go to my Robert Hodgkin YouTube channel, Rumble channel, Instagram accounts, all that social media stuff, so that you can get everything we have for you all for free. We have noticed, let's say, a thinning of uh, uh, the, the number of people that our videos are going out to through the Facebook stream. We're very grateful for this platform, but something's been going on that we've noticed and we'd love to see you move over to get all the, the content we have for you for free on YouTube. It's as simple as going to YouTube, search for Robert Hodgkin, like the channel, subscribe to the channel, follow the channel, whatever the current verbiage is, and then do me a favor and like and, uh, like and share the videos. I, was, I made a new 
word for you, subshare. So subscribe and share when you like those videos. Um, the other thing you can do is remember Heroes Arise and the new short form devotional podcast, Word Up with Robert Hodgkin. Those are all available as audio feeds on all your favorite podcast platforms. So you can like those, subscribe those, share those as well. You are our marketing department and we're incredibly grateful for you. So make a note of sharing, make a point and make a note of sharing our videos with the people you know that it will be an encouragement to. All right, let's get into this week's topic. Back with me again, Rob Winters. Thank you for having me. Uh, you know what? Your show last week was so great, and um, it was I got a lot out of it. I know our audience got a lot out of it, that we wanted to go through more of these pitfalls. And you wrote this manual, Prophetic Prophets in Prophetic Ministry, and it's a great course to help raise people up in the prophetic, but also really in the prophetic uh, uh, character and nature um, and establishing everything as you said so well on last week's show from, an, from intimacy and relationship yeah. and really being rooted and grounded in that but you brought forth these seven pitfalls of the mm -hmm. prophetic and we did the first three on last week's show we talked about the pitfall of phobia we talked about the pitfall of pride and we talked about the pitfall of prestige but this week Rob I'd like to jump right in and one of the other seven pitfalls you identify is the pitfall of power. Now, one of the things I want to ask is Jesus himself says we're to, we're to move in power. Right. We're to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. He promises that Holy Spirit will come upon us in power right. so that we can be great and mighty witnesses of him. Right. Obviously, the prophetic is part of witnessing of him, right. of preaching prophetically, sharing prophetically from his heart, uh, letting people who aren't hearing from him or the lost know who he is, what he's like, and what he's saying. So I know you very well. You're a seasoned prophet. You lead an amazing church. You've been at this a long time. I know you're not saying that the power of the Holy Spirit is right. a pitfall, just the opposite. So what's the pitfall of power for the prophetic. Yeah, I, I believe it's the obsession of power. You know, um, there's nine gifts of the Spirit, but there's also nine fruit of the Spirit. And I think it's interesting that there's nine of each, because I think we need to grow not only in the power of God and the gifts of the Spirit, but we also need to grow in the fruit of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. and unfortunately, what we've seen over the last several decades is we see people moving in power, but yet their character doesn't match it. And so uh, I, I believe there should be a balance of growing up in both of those. Uh, so I, I think that we need to move in power, seek the gifts, but we also need to seek the fruit as well. So we, there's a balance in growing up in all of these things. And I think the Lord is wise in not empowering us with something that our character can't handle. And uh, so I think sometimes we want to get ahead of the game. And, it's not power in and of itself that's a pitfall. It's the obsession with power. That's really good. That is is the pitfall. That's really good. You know, um, we talked last week a lot about the foundations of the character and nature of God and, and how we want to really want to build on all of that. I mean, even Jesus did that. He said, I do nothing myself, but I only do what my Father shows me. Um, and so everything was about, Father, what do you want to do, not what can I be known for? Would it be fair to say that the pitfall of power would be making an idol out of power? Yeah. Or making making an idol out of being seen as powerful? You know, yes. we have the old expression of the man, God's man of power for the hour, or God's woman of power for the hour. Well, we want to move in that power, but we don't want to be obsessed with or make an idol out of being known as moving in power. Right. I, ag I agree with that 100%. Um, so, yeah, we can make an idolatry of just about anything, and one of those things is power. We need to walk in faith and power. You know, Jesus went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. He was anointed with the Holy Ghost and power. Right, right. You know, he gave us a promise. You shall uh, receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and will be his witnesses. But we got to realize it's not our power. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, we're nothing. We can do nothing without him. In fact, you know, Peter at one point says, why do you look at us as if it is through our holiness or our power that we're doing these things? We got to realize it's the Holy Spirit within us that generates the power, the dunamis power of God to do the signs, wonders, and miracles. But it is, we're not the author of it. We're not the source of it. It's the Holy Spirit living within us, but he's also the source of the fruit of the Spirit as well. So I feel like we need to continue teaching uh, 
you know, the fruit and the gifts, yeah. that we don't overemphasize one or the other, but we're to grow up in all things in Christ and both the gifts of God and the Spirit of God and the, and, and the fruit of the Spirit so that we can have a balanced ministry that actually is a praise unto the Lord and not, right. you know, something that is a, a takeaway. Well, you know, we've all heard too many stories of men and women of God who have moved powerfully and gloriously, to, literally to the glory of God in the pulpit, but then there are really bad things going on outside the pulpit. Yeah. And I sometimes wonder if the reason that happens is because they're seeing so many words of knowledge or miracles or whatever it is, but since we're talking about the prophetic, let's talk about power displays of the, of the prophetic, words of knowledge, um, all those things that people really go, whoa, and that's wonderful to put God on display like that. but. Is part of the trap of power, the pitfall of power, that if you start to not operate in the character and nature of God and the integrity of God outside the pulpit, but you're still seeing that because the gifts of God are without repentance. So it's not like he says, you're being a bad boy, I'm taking this away, because none of what we flow in is based on our ability to earn it. It's all based right. on what Christ has done for us and right. accessing it by faith. But I wonder if sometimes because ministers continue to get the word knowledge, continue to get the spot on prophetic word, continue to get the social security number, the address, or those things that really make people marvel at our God, while they're doing these other things that they start to sin all the more because yeah. all they're focused on is, hey, I'm moving in power, it must be okay, where the enemy actually is like, well, Go ahead and move in power for a season. That's great because what you don't realize is in the spirit, every time you sin, you're actually getting further and further away from God. God's not getting further and further away from us. That's why we still flow in power. But we get further and further away from God until we end up doing way more damage to the body through the bad choices we make. Right. And we think we're getting away with it because we're still flowing in power. Right. And, and that's the deception is that moving in power, we assume that that's God's validation and it's not. It's not his validation. Right. Here's the thing, the gifts of the Spirit, they're not for you, they're for the people. So, so for a season, God will allow people to operate in things because we gotta realize the gifts are for the people. And so he allows that for a season, but I believe in his mercy, he will take that away. Because I mean, we've seen numerous examples in the body of Christ of those that have operated in great power, right. even raising people from the dead. But yet we find that in their personal life, they're, they're drunkards, they're, they commit adultery, they're doing all these things to discredit uh, you know, the, the, the message of, of Jesus Christ. And what happens is, is then the enemy allows the world to label Christians as fakes and phonies and all these types of things. It just keeps people further and further away from, from the Lord. Yeah. But I believe that God's raising a new standard. You know, we've been crying out for a baptism of fire. You know, so many of us want a baptism of the Holy Spirit, but, he, but Jesus said that he would baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. Mm -hmm. What we don't really realize is that that baptism of fire is the baptism of repentance. Mm. The Bible in Isaiah 4, 4 talks about the spirit of judgment mm. and burning. And what I think that we've lost focus is, is that the office of the prophet, one of the primary uh, purposes of that office is to preach repentance. Mm. We have a tendency to believe that preaching repentance is an Old Testament right. uh, you know, paradigm for the office of the prophet, but not so. It's so much a part of uh, what the body of Christ should be walking in right now, what prophets should be walking in. So there is this aspect of preaching repentance, but also prophesying restoration, moving in power. But I believe we need a fresh baptism mm, of fire. I agree. The spirit of judgment and burning, grant us repentance to the acknowledging of the truth so that we can operate in the power more. So I, I believe that's what God's wanting to bring. He's wanting to bring, bring a cleansing fire uh, to cleanse us, purge us, purify us, that we are those vessels for his honorable use, that we're fit for the master's use. Right. And I think that is so important in the body of Christ today that we, we have that message of repentance and that equipping word that we equip the saint for the work of the ministry mm -hmm. so that we can be qualified witnesses for Christ, that we're not ashamed to his name, amen? amen. That we uh, actually represent uh, the words of God, the works of God, and his ways as well. I love it. You know, I have, uh, about a year and a half now, I've been prophesying that the coming move of God is going to be marked by his personality. Mm. Um, we've had moves mm. of his power. We've had moves marked by his presence. And I believe this coming move will be marked by 
power and presence, or will it will include power and presence? Because mm -hmm. when God's present, of course His power is there. But I think one of the things that's really going to mark this coming move is His personality, mm -hmm. um, His integrity, His character, His nature, His genuine humility, His genuine servanthood. And I think the reason that we need that is not only for an integrity's sake within the church, but we're talking about a move of God that we're believing will bring in billions of souls. Right. And let's face right. it, a lot of what making an idol out of power and being powerful in the pulpit and thinking that justifies all the wrong things we're doing outside of the pulpit, mm -hmm. you said it, it not only really hurts the body, um, but it sends this really mixed disqualifying message to the mm -hmm. lost right. and I think there's a lot of people out there that don't have any interest in getting a prophetic word from well I'll say from God but really from a Christian that they think is a um, um, hypocrite um, whereas if we're moving in love if we're moving in kindness if we're moving in compassion mm. if we're moving in integrity if we're moving in all those things that are God's personality the lost will be so drawn to us that now the personality of God through us will make way for the power of God through us, which will make way for them to come into the presence of God right. because of us and come to know him. And I think that's been a missing link in part of, my, I've been a Christian for 19 years and two weeks now. And one of the things, I and I came in through a sovereign encounter with God, the God I'd made fun of, and I immediately was drawn to, um, events and conferences where God was put on display powerfully. Even in my own personal prayer time, he was put on display powerfully, very real to me. Um, and there's always a need for that because God is powerful. But I think we've been missing his personality. And I really, I, I really like what you're saying, especially in regards to the prophetic. We have to be aware that we are to flow in power, to, to, but not make an idol out of be obsessed with power or get our identity from power. Right, exactly. I, I like what you said about this move would be a, a demonstration of the personality of God. Mm -hmm. Because we got to realize that our, our paradigm or viewpoint of who God is will affect how we prophesy. Not only how we prophesy, but what we prophesy. Yeah. You know, if we see him just as a God of judgment and all these types of things, Ooh, then we're going to misrepresent the character of God. That's good. And so, you know, we need to know, I, I love the scripture, said to, to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge, that we would be filled with mm. all the fullness of God. I don't think we uh, understand the fullness of knowing the love of Christ, you know. Um, you know, the Bible also says that faith works by love. And when you know the love of God, it's going to build such faith in you that you, you know that God wants the best for you. He wants you to be healed. He wants you to be prosperous. He wants you to be blessed. All of those things. And if you have a misrepresentation of the love of God, you're not going to have faith towards God. And that's why I believe that's really important that we begin to understand the personality and represent the personality of God. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I always think of John 4 when I think about how important the personality of God is, the character and nature of God is, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is to make way for the gifts and the power. Right. Because, you know, we all know the story so well, but in John 4, the Samaritan woman comes to the well, and I think she's coming in the middle of the day because she's the town harlot and she doesn't want to be around anybody. Right. Everybody's already gotten their water and left and she walks up and it's like, oh my goodness, there's, there's a Jew there and not just a Jew, but a male Jew and not just a male Jew, but a rabbi. Oh man. So she's probably thinking, I want to get in and out as fast as possible, man. And he has this conversation with her and it comes down to her admitting, yeah, the man I'm living with is not my husband. Mm. Why would she do that? Because in, the t in that day, in that situation, she's just given him the legal right to stone her to death. Mm. She is admitted to being an adultery. Why would she do that? Because I believe Jesus so not only walked in power, but he obviously walked in the personality of God. She right. felt loved enough, safe enough to admit this stronghold in her life. I've been looking for love in all the wrong places for a really long time. Right. And he, it, it's it's that that his he always walked in power, but he never thought power was more important than revealing the heart of the Father. And because he revealed the heart of the Father, this woman felt safe to be vulnerable with him to the point of giving him the legal right to kill her on the spot. He could have picked up a rock and killed her legally as a male Jewish rabbi. And yeah. yet, it 
it, it's, we have to have the power. I, and you guys know, we talk about this. I so want the power. My friend Ben Hughes talks about we have no right to convict someone of a lifestyle unless we have the power to set them free. And the good news is we do have the power to set them free. We must walk in the power, but we can't make the power more than the personality, more than character, more than integrity. Because I think I told the story when you were with us last week about how when I first got saved, God made himself very, very real to me and flowed through me very powerfully. And I'd actually go out on the road with um, um, uh, the people who raised me up in ministry and at the prayer times pray for people. And sometimes I'd wave my hand and 30, 40, 50 people would fall down in the spirit. Mm -hmm. I am so, so grateful that my mentors cared about me enough and believed in me enough to sit me down and said to me, look, God can po flow power through a donkey. We're not impressed by the power of God moving through you. We're impressed by God and his power, but right. he can flow that through anybody. Right. So what you need to work on is your, the, your integrity, your character. You need to be able to present the personality of God as right. much as the power of God. And so we want to be really clear, guys. We're not talking about turn away from the power. Power is absolutely not a pitfall. As, as Rob said so clearly and mentioned so many of the scriptures, Jesus tells us to move in power. He commissions us to move in power. He gave us his Holy Spirit to move in power. But we don't want to make an idol out of power or use it as a excuse to be, to live a life outside of ministry that right. would turn people off to the reality of Jesus. Right. So you not only give the pitfalls, but you, you, you very helpfully give what you call the proverb, the proverbial prescription for a pitfall. What's the proverbial prescription for the pitfall of power? That is a lot of peas, my friend. Yeah, that's, <laughs> there's a lot of peas there. I, I just want to go back to Simon the Sorcerer. Yes. You know, he, he had a desire for, for the power. So when Peter and John came, you know, in the book of Acts to his town, and he saw that when they laid hands on people that they received the Holy Spirit, yes. he made a demand. He said, give me that power also that whoever I lay my hands on will receive the Holy Spirit. But you know, Peter and John discerned that his heart wasn't right mm. with God and he, and, and he even offered him money for, for that gift. And he said, you know, let your money perish with you that, that you think you could buy, you know, the gift of God and he, he basically called him out. He just said, your heart is not right with God for you're, 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 you're poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. So it kind of identified the sorts of that desire or the obsession for power was bitterness and jealousy because Peter and John had come and taken his place in the community as the great power of God. And so now there was a jealous spirit there. So mm. I feel like the, sometimes the root of that seeking for power is that that jealousy and what happens unfortunately in the body of Christ is people want to short circuit the process of God building character in you and they want the power at any cost so what happens is and I believe it was the case with Simon the Sorcerer is they resort to operating in witchcraft uh. they operate you know in the spirit of divination familiar spirits and mm. um, unfortunately, I've actually seen this operate in the body of Christ. Mm. I've seen ministers that have gained fame, but they actually operate in a familiar spirit, a spirit of divination. And they're actually getting uh, correct facts, but how they're getting them is through demonic sources. Wow. And so that actually defiles the ministry that they're bringing forth because it's not just the accuracy of it, it's the source of it, amen? Yes, And so, um, so, so Simon the Sorcerer was subject to that jealousy. And the thing is, it's a, again, it's a sign of, a, of an orphan spirit, someone who is insecure in who they are in God, and they're so obsessed with power that uh, they don't press into the Lord to find their identity in Christ. And I think that's so important that we need to have intimacy with God, again, to find our identity in God. And out of our identity in God, God will give us the authority and the power that he feels that we need to operate in so that we can be a blessing to people, but not a hazard to our own lives. Yeah. Well, you know, I think about when Jesus came into the city of Nain and he sees the funeral and, and the, the New Living clearly translates this as at least the 95, I don't know about the current New Living, but my old 95 New Living says, and compassion overflowed his heart. Mm. Um, because I mm. think about that, he's not just seeing a funeral, he's seeing the funeral of a, a, a mother who's lost her son, mm -hmm. and not just a mother who lost her son, but a widow who's already lost her husband and now has lost her son. And he's gonna move in power, but what I find interesting is what opens the door to that power is his heart overflowing with compassion. Yeah. His heart it's breaks good. for the situation, and that actually yeah. causes the raising of the dead. So 
the wonderful thing about the kingdom is oftentimes when we go after the thing that matters most, God himself, relationship mm. with God, intimacy with God, all yeah. the other things increase. Because again, right. we are absolutely to move in power, but the more we connect with his heart, and the more, the less we make an idol out of power, I think the more power we'll see. I agree. You know, just one one point Absolutely. on that is First uh, Corinthians fourteen one, because uh, he gives mm. uh, Paul gives us expose, you know, on the gifts of the spirit. He talks about love in chapter thirteen and how the gifts are supposed to operate, but he makes a distinction. He says, pursue love yeah. and earnestly covet spiritual gifts, but rather you may prophesy. Wow. Notice number one, yeah. pursue love. Yeah. That's got to be number one. Yeah that we pursue that compassion that you're talking about, that we would be moved with compassion and operate in the gifts of God, and that we would seek for the edification of the mm. church, not to be seen, right. but Lord, how can I bless your church? Right. And I think if we keep that attitude and that heart, God's gonna be able to use us in outstanding, power. Outstanding, outstanding. All right, let's talk about uh, the next pitfall that we are going to avoid. It's um, the pitfall of profit. Um, talk about that, the, the pitfall of profit. Um, I think this is a, a really important topic um, on multiple levels, but before I, I don't want to take us down a path that you, you, that you didn't intend, so go ahead and talk to us about the pitfall of profit. Well, you know, there's an example in the Old Testament with Balaam. He actually was a prophet called of the Lord to be a prophet, but he was, uh, you know, he was petitioned by a, a king, a Moabite king by the name of Balak. And uh, of course, the Moabs, the Moabites, they were against Israel. And so he wanted to pay a, a diviner's fee. He wanted to pay Balaam to curse Israel. And Balaam knew that he couldn't curse Israel. But what he did do is he, he, taught, he, he taught the Israel how they could sin so that they would fall out of favor with God and put Israel in the position where they would be subject to uh, the judgment of God. Okay. And so what he did was, because he couldn't curse the people, but what he did is, it's actually called the doctrine of Balaam in scripture, that he actually taught them to sin by mm. committing uh, fornication and adultery with these wicked nations that worshiped other gods. And so what he literally did was he turned the heart of a whole nation away from the Lord. Mm. And they were under King Jeroboam, who has kind of set the sin standard for all the mm. other kings in the Old Testament, that the sin of Jeroboam was that they, they actually turned the people away from serving the living God, this form of idolatry and literally spirit of harlotry that turned Israel away from the God. And they, and, and they actually, uh, had a great penalty because of that. Mm. And so, but it was because he paid him money that he mm. taught them to sin against the Lord. But there was actually just a seed of greed in him. You know, okay. we've been talking about Baal, we've been talking about Jezebel, right. but there is a real God of mammon, you know, and the Bible says you can't serve God and right. mammon. You got to make one of them your God. And so much in the body of Christ is motivated by money. So many people are motivated right. by greed the love of money, which is the root of all kinds yeah. of evil. And yeah. we find that, that Balaam was motivated uh, by greed. Right. If you look in Jude one eleven, he says that, for they have gone the way of Cain, have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit. And it's really unfortunate, mm. but Balaam, who was called to be a prophet of God, when his life ended, he was named a soothsayer. Mm. He, was, he was actually a charlatan. He moved in divination and, and be, because he was corrupted by greed. Right. Well, let me, let me ask a big question, but we'll, 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 we'll focus it in on prophetic ministry as well. But you touched on how the, the love of money is the root of all evil, making mammon, serving mammon instead of serving the Lord. I think a poverty mindset's gotten into much of the church because they've confused that absolute truth that the love of money is the root of all evil with <clears throat> this lie that money is evil, right. where money's just a tool. Now, what I want to ask about this, because I think it's really important that we discuss this, and you're absolutely right that, that with, with Balaam, we have this clear example of mm -hmm. when you're doing something from God, but to serve something else, it's dangerous, including serving profit. But, you know, I'm sure you've run into this. Like, um, 
we run into this as a ministry sometimes where people get very upset with us that like we have a price on our CDs or our courses. And they always say, you know, Jesus didn't charge anything for the gospel. And the easy, simple, almost flippant answer is, well, it's because he didn't have CDs or books. And he didn't have, you know, printing and pressing charges. And I, and God knows my heart. I'm, I'm making light of it slightly. But there is the reality of there are some costs involved in modern-day right. ministry. Right. Um, and I totally get and we do so much stuff for free. All of our, you guys know, all of our online content, all, everything that we're creating here, the studio, the lights, the camera, we generate it and we send it out there to you for free. And it's our privilege and honor to do it. There are legitimate costs involved right. in doing that. And of right. course, we're trusting God for that. And yet there's also things like I admit when I go out and speak at conferences and, and that can involve prophetic ministry, I often receive a love offering or an mm -hmm. honorarium. Mm -hmm. How do we separate the reality of ministry costs and the blessing of receiving an honorarium with this idea and make sure that we don't ever turn profit into any kind of motive so that it becomes a pitfall? Well, yeah, so it just can't become a, an idol. Okay. You know, a, you know, a mammon is, is an idol that people serve and uh, then they begin to you know, speak through an idol. Okay. You know, a lot of a lot of times, uh, that's one reason why prophets get in error because mm -hmm. they want to prophesy based on what they feel like a good offering will bring. Oh. And, and and so oh. what so what happens is we've got what I call plumb line prophets and we've got party line prophets. Wow. So plumb line prophets, they're aligned with the house of the Lord. The fear of the Lord's dropped in their heart, and God's dropped their, the plumb line of truth in their heart to where they're not going to compromise on the truth of the Lord, regardless if they get an honorarium or they get thrown in jail or whatever. Okay. So I, I think that's the standard that has to be set. But yeah. what happens is, is when people become what I call party line prophets, they want to prophesy the party line, what everyone wants to hear. They listen to other prophets, and whatever the people want to hear, that's mm. what they speak. Okay. But oftentimes, it's not what people want to hear, what they need to hear. Exactly. And so even like in the case of Micaiah, he told the king the true word of the Lord. Where did it land him? It landed him in prison. He was eating bread and water, drinking water. And until uh, his prophecy came to pass, he had to suffer persecution. So I, I think that's what we need to realize is that we need to drop the plumb line of God's word in our heart so that we're prophesying in the spirit of the fear of the Lord and not in the fear of man. So that's what happens a lot is people want to give a nice, I call them fluffy prophecies, right. you know, nice fluffy prophecies so you'll, you know, get a big offering. I've mm. actually had people come and present $100 bills and flash them in front of me. It was, you know, in a prophetic line, they'd flash a $100 bill, give it to me, and they wanted a nice fluffy prophecy. Wow. Yeah, so I mean, there, there's all kind of- I thought of, I'd seen everything. I've never yeah, seen that. Wow. There's been all kind of abuses in the prophetic. But, you know, we, we've got to prophesy uh, in the fear of the Lord yes. and, 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 and not, the, you know, a lot of times we can discern the secrets of men's heart, but we need to prophesy in the fear of the Lord, pro prophesy the word of the Lord and not the secrets of men's hearts because men's hearts are tainted. Okay. And what happens is, is people, they read people's hearts right. and they prophesy according to what's in their heart as if it was the will of God. And it's really a sin because you're actually succumbing to uh, that spirit of mammon because, oh, I'm going to get a big offering if I give mm. a good prophecy. And that's one reason why uh, prophets don't preach repentance anymore because oh, it's not wow. a popular message. Nobody wants to hear a message, a corrective word of, uh, you know, judgment or a corrective word uh, that would cause people to repent. No, they want to hear a nice fluffy prophecy. They want to hear all about these good things. But I think we need to come into balance and come in alignment with that plumb line that we're actually representing the heart of God, that we don't give people something they can't handle, or there's a, there's a delusion of grandeur that's created through a prophecy that is uh, embellished. You know, we need to really prophesy from the books of heaven. Mm, the Bible right. talks about the, the books of heaven. In your book, they all were written. The days right. you had fashioned for me, when yet there was none of them. When we're truly operating in the, in the, in the gift of prophecy, I believe it's, you know, Psalm 139, verse 16, it talks about that. There is a book in heaven that was written before time began about mm. our lives. He mm. saved us, called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to uh, his own purposes in Christ Jesus before time began. Wow. He had a plan and purpose. So when we're really hearing from heaven, I believe that in, our, in, in the book there are good things. But if God's high 
highlighting something in our lives that would be a ditch to our ministry. We are doing a disservice if we don't highlight, say, hey, you're operating in, maybe in, you're in pride, or you're in a relationship that is not of God. Right. And if you will separate from that, God will release you into his higher purposes. We need to be able to give those words instead yes. of these you know, puffy cream pie words wow. that, that are actually going to do damage to a person. I agree completely. I, you know, as I said, I thought I'd seen everything, but obviously there's a lot out there I haven't seen, and I'm grateful that I haven't seen it. But to boil everything down, would it be fair to say, um, because, you know, I know of I know of some ministries out there that have, um, and one I talked to, I can't speak to all of them, but one I had a conversation with, they were they were saying, hey, if you send an offering, a donation of $10, we'll give you a prophetic word. And that I found that a little challenging, I admit, um, but I was able to reach out and talk to one of the person and and they said, well, for us, it's no different than, you know, uh, a, a book we sell or a CD we sell. Um, and they, we didn't put it this way, we didn't come to see things eye to eye, but I know it's not my place to judge them. But all of this, like, as much as I might wrestle with that, really it always comes down to the motive of the heart, right? Right. And the posture it of does. the heart. It does. And I always think in situations like that, um, I don't really know. And for all we know, God has told them to do this. Um, and it's not for me to judge. That's why I said at the top of this show and part one of this show, this isn't about pointing fingers at anybody in the prophetic or finding fault with anybody in the prophetic. This is about giving us plumb lines so that we avoid these pitfalls. And I know for me, especially early on in ministry, I was blessed many times with going and preaching my heart out and prophesying over regions and at the end of the meetings getting a handshake or a hug and really being able to examine my heart. Oftentimes that was overseas when there was a lot of costs involved in travel. Right, right. And I was fortunate to be raised up by someone who told me, boy, God is being so good to you. He's being so good to you in this that you're really getting the chance to test the motive of your heart. Right. What are you right. preaching the gospel for? What are you prophesying for? And I'm very, very grateful for that because to be honest, I'm a little shocked by things like somebody would wave a hundred dollar bill in yep. front of somebody for a, a good word. I'm not doubting you, I'm just a little yeah. shocked. Oh, yeah. So to make sure that we all stay out of a place of judgment and criticism of others, we should work with Holy Spirit to watch over the motives of our heart Right. and embrace those opportunities when we can be tested in those areas. Well, I agree with that. You know, there is something called the merchandising of the anointing, and we don't want to merchandise right. it. Free, freely we have received, freely give. We have paid a price for it in prayer to give the gift of, uh, of the Lord through the prophetic word, but we, we, we got to be careful that we don't, uh, you know, have people pay for it because it's something that God yeah. has given us as a gift that's freely given. Yeah. And here's the thing, God God will make a way for us, right? If we're truly his servants, and a lot of times when we get in financial crisis, like, okay, God, this is your right. ministry, right. this is your church, you know, if, if you want this thing to fly, and he does, yep. supernaturally, right. bring, you know, bring those finances in or when we're challenged that way. And so it's really not about the money. You know, it, 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 it's being a blessing that God's called us to, to be, and he will make it up to us if maybe we're shorted on this yeah. particular place. Always You has. know, he, he always makes it up. Yeah. yeah. You know, one story that just came to mind in regards to this was all the years I got to serve in Thailand, and we would do outreaches all the time. We'd do outreaches into the brothels. We'd do outreach all over the place. But one of the things we started doing was we did business blessing outreaches. And we'd walk up and down the streets and go into the businesses and say, hey, you know, our God sent us here from North America. We, If you'd let us pray in his name, we'd love to pray a blessing on your business. And, and we'd usually end up prophesying over them as well. Mm. And they loved it. But what the biggest surprise to them was when we were all done, they'd offer us money. Because in their culture, that's what you did when other priests of other religions came to release a blessing. Mm -hmm. It was one of the ways they did fundraising. Right. And um, when they would offer us money and we'd say, oh, no, actually, we're here just to give this to you. Our, our God just wants to bless you. Once you know. That would mean as much to them as the blessing and the, the expectation of something good coming from it. I didn't even say mean as much. That's actually what got their attention. It was like that our God, and I remember one lady, she was like, she wasn't sure, she had heard of Jesus, but kind of didn't want anything to do with him, and, but she really having a hard time with her business. And so I said, you know what, and she didn't want to let us in. I said, hey, you know what, 
our God's a big God. He can bless you from out here on the sidewalk. Would it be okay? And she finally said, all right, but she didn't want to pay for it because she didn't believe in that God. It's like, no problem. You don't need to. While we're praying for her and, and prophesying blessing over her from the heart of God, no kidding, while we're doing it, behind her, six people walk into her store over the course of the time we're praying. And she was wow. so blown away. She's like, now I have to pay you for it. No, you can't. You can't pay. You can't pay God. It's just the way it works. Well, yeah, you know, and the thing is, is uh, finances just reveal honor. That's all. You know, the Bible right. says, receive a exactly. prophet in the name of a totally. prophet. You receive a prophet's reward. Well, how do you receive one? Someone. Yeah. You receive them by honor. One of the Good. ways that you honor someone is to give them what? An honorarium, That's right? right? That's how you That's show right. honor. Yeah. And actually, when you give into a gift, it's an act of faith that actually, when you sow into a ministry, it's an act of faith that actually is, a, in, in one sense, a spiritual trade. Mm. And in a sense, you're, you're, you're sowing into it and you have drawing rights now on that right. gift because you have sowed in faith in that gift that they're drawing rights on the gift on that person. So that's what we tell people. Hey, we want to honor the so speaker good. God's brought. And see, we receive the offerings before they even minister. There you go. That's so brilliant. it's no manipulation at all. We receive the offerings brilliant. before they even take the stage. It's like we recognize who they are. Let's receive this prophet. This is one way to honor the prophet or the apostle, whoever he is, is to sow into their ministry. And when you do that, it actually there is a spiritual change because our finances speak yeah. in heaven. They do. Right. When we right. give, there is, there is a principle of sowing and, and, and the, the Lord opening up the windows of heaven. So that's not just finances. It's actually receiving gifts from the mm -hmm. Lord, the prophet's reward by making a demand on that gift by faith, sowing into it. Then it has drawing rights to receive right. from that gift. And that's what you experienced that's there, there yeah. in Singapore. Well, can you imagine a farmer standing in front of a field and saying, Look, I'm a little concerned, so I refuse to sow any seed, but I'm expecting plants to come up. So the difference is between there's nothing wrong with receiving honorarium, receiving mm -hmm. blessing, receiving all of that, but it's about the posture of the heart. That's not what you go for. That's not right. what you prophesy for, and you certainly do not demand that when right. you go. All right. right. So I think we've already covered it, but just to make sure, because in your manual, you do such a great job of pointing out the pitfall, but also go giving the prescription or the solution. What is the proverbial prophetic prescription against profit? All right, there, there's two of them that okay. I found out of Proverbs. One's Proverbs 119. It says, so are the ways of everyone who is greedy for gain. It takes away the life of the owners. Proverbs 11, 28, mm. he who trusts in his riches will, will fall. And what I found with, with mammon, it actually takes over your whole life. It mm. becomes an obsession, mammon becomes a God and you see everything and hear everything through mammon. It literally takes your life over. Okay. But there is a penalty for that. The Bible says that he who trusts in his riches will fall. Mm. And so I think that's a good exhortation okay. for not only prophets, but for everyone in the body of Christ. Outstanding. All right, let's do one more pitfall this show. It's, it's your pitfall number seven, the prophetic pitfall of pornography. Yeah. Now, um, this obviously is a big topic, and right. especially for the guys in our audience. Although, let's get real. I think, I think sometimes we, we focus so much on the, the issue with men in pornography, we forget that there are, there are wonderful women of God who wrestle with this as well. And before we go into this, the first thing I want to say is you are loved and you are forgiven. And if by chance this is a pitfall you've fallen into, I get that there's a lot of guilt and shame around this, but you are loved and you are forgiven. And we're gonna believe if you've fallen into this, this trap that you are going to get set free, even right now while we talk about this. So talk Amen. a little bit about the pitfall of pornography for the prophetic. Yeah, it is, it is rampant in the body of Christ. And like you said, no condemnation. We wanna get people healed up so they can serve the living God. But there was this, uh, there was a, uh, you know, survey done on Christian men, people, men that go to church, that 68% of Christian men in America actually practice pornography oh. monthly. It's a monthly thing. Mm. And even the ministers, 50% of ministers are, are hooked on pornography and they look at that regularly. So it is a real problem in the body of Christ because you're, you know, looking, Jesus even equated uh, that if you look upon a woman with lust in her heart, that you've committed adultery right. in your heart. And right. so, really, adultery is an issue of the heart. The Bible says to keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. So I think that we need to, you know, discern who we're going to serve. Either we're going to serve God and live in a world or, 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 or serve the Father. 
The Bible says in 1 John 2, do not love the world nor the things in the world. For if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life are all of the world. And that world is passing away. Yeah. So even James, if you look in the book of James, he literally calls, he's addressing Christians here. It's a letter to Christians. Right. And he says, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And that Ooh. word enmity means hatred towards God. For whoever loves the world becomes an enemy of God. Yeah. And what he's actually saying that there are people that are so ingrained in some of these worldly things, lots of the flesh, lots of the eyes, they unwittingly have become enemies of God. Wow. And so wow. What, does he, what does he say? He says, he says, draw near unto the Lord and he will draw near to you. Repent. You know, turn from your wicked ways. You know, humble yourself under the mighty hand of the Lord yeah. and he will lift you up. And wow. so th this is some very serious stuff, but we find that even like in the life of Samson, his compromises with women, mm -hmm. you know, cost him his eyes, mm -hmm. cost him his very life. Yeah. And so we see that today that, 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 you know, so many have been taken by pornography and you know, the thing is, if you feast your eyes on things you shouldn't be feasting, how can you see prophetically? Right. right. Because not exactly. only do your natural eyes see, but our spirit has eyes too, just like our spirit has ears, our spirit have eyes. You know, Paul prayed, he said that the Father of glory would grant you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. The eyes of your understanding, that word understanding literally means heart. The eyes of oh. your heart or the eyes of your spirit. When the Bible talks about your heart, it's not your blood pump. Everybody you know, talks about your blood pump, right. but your spirit man is down in your belly. Mm. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching the innermost parts of the belly. This is where your spirit man is and it has eyes. Wow. And so when we contaminate our hearts by looking at pornography, it actually blinds our spiritual eyes. So we can't wow. see, we can't have the visions that God wants us to see. He, that he wants to show us things to come in visions. And so it's a real contamination. Mm. It's a blinding of, of our spiritual eyes so we can't actually see prophetically what God's doing. Wow, that's really good. And you know, that we know that the mouth can bless or curse, that in the power of the mouth there's um, life and death, blessing or cursing. And the Lord tells us to choose life with our mouth. And prophetically we want to speak, you know, the, the truth of God. We talk a lot about, guys, how when we see in Genesis 1-3, God didn't deal with darkness by speaking more darkness. He spoke light. So prophetically we want to speak light. but but when you're talking about this issue of pornography and the eyes, because the prophetic is so much, how do I say this? In addition to, I didn't want to say so much more then, but in addition to being able to hear God and mm -hmm. speak his word and speak his heart, there's the whole seer anointing. Right. And if we right. are submitting our eyes to that stuff, the way you describe that, both the eye and the heart getting almost fouled and this this right. this this uh, uh, signal interruption it, that's really really important and you look at Samson I just heard somebody at our men's event last week Pastor Johnny Thompson taught this incredible message gave this great word on how Delilah's become blessing blockers and that's mm. not in the sense of a person but anything we give our attention and focus to other than God distractions from God's plan for our life God's character or nature like we've been talking about and then to think about in the regards to say pornography mm -hmm. which in all the things that we think of when we heard the por word pornography pictures films graphic images but any really thing that is not God's best for us is almost a type of pornography. Now, I'm not making any excuse for the other type but I'm saying we need to expand yeah. our idea of what that can be in addition right. to all that stuff we shouldn't be looking at because of how it fouls the pipes. Right, I agree and you know Jesus gave a very clear prescription on how to deal with that out of Matthew chapter 5 verse 27. He said, whoever looks at a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Verse 29, if your right eye causes you to sin, mm. pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. So Jesus is like, we need to be ruthless yeah. with the sin. Now, not literally pull your right. eye out. Right. But I really believe the secret here is the fear of the Lord. One of the definitions for the fear of the Lord is to love righteousness and hate lawlessness. Mm. And this is one of the secrets I've learned and I believe other people uh, I want to share this with. 
is if you're having a problem with pornography, you need to pray to the Lord. Lord, give me a hatred. Yes. Give me a hatred for pornography. And if you pray that, God will answer that prayer. Give me a hatred for anything like that. And, and, and even uh, Job, he said, I made a covenant with my eyes that I would Ooh, not look good. lustfully upon a woman. And, 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 and ask the Lord for the grace to, to deal ruthlessly with that sin. Yes, and Lord. if you have a hatred for something, guess what? You're not going to do it, church. You're not going to do it. If you have a hatred for that thing, and that's the fear of the Lord. So God, I want the fear of the mm. Lord regarding this sin. So I don't commit it. So give me a hatred for what you hate and a love for what you love. And Lord, you hate defilement. You hate these things that, that contaminate our walk with you. Lord, give me a hatred for the sin of pornography. He will answer that prayer and he will cleanse us of that unrighteousness so that we can walk in covenant with him. Outstanding, outstanding. You know, guys, we talk about a lot that with, with men on the front line specifically and at our Heroes Arise events and our Man Camp Men's Retreats, we focus a lot on who we truly are in God because what we've discovered is there are guys who wrestle with all sorts of stuff, but as we focus on who we truly are, those things that we aren't tend to fall away. So what Rob just said is so important in this area, but part of the key is also ask Holy Spirit to help you remember who you are as a son of God. So when those things, the temptation comes, all of a sudden you realize, wait, that's not who I am. Because one of the things the Lord has showed us that we share with the guys at our events is temptation's not failure, temptation's opportunity. Mm. One of the things that the devil okay. twists and lies, specifically in this area, is if we're wrestling mm. with lustful thoughts or lustful images, well, I'm already wrestling with those, so I've failed, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm already a bad guy. And then all of a sudden there's like this sense of, oh, I might as well just go ahead and follow through, as, we posed to, as, as opposed to realizing Jesus was tempted in all things right. and never right. sinned. Right. So some temptation is not failure, right. it's an opportunity opportunity to push back against the enemy from the realization of who you truly are and everything Rob just shared about the grace of the Lord, to have the fear of the Lord, to, to make a covenant with your eyes, all of that all of a sudden now, when you have that temptation, you're not covered with guilt and shame and this sort of like, ah, I've already failed. But you realize this is my opportunity to push back against the enemy and take territory for the kingdom. That was outstanding, Rob. Thank you for sharing that. Amen. Okay, just before I have you look into your camera and pray for the audience to bring things to a close today, let everybody know where they can get this manual because there's so much in this. We're just covering one one area of the entire course with when we talk about the pitfalls there's a whole lot more let them know where they can get it and where they can get more from you yeah this this son the pitfalls this is actually one session out of 12 right. there's there's 12 sessions uh, in this book this is one that we're we're covering over the last three sessions of this but um, you could get this manual as prophets and prophetic ministry at www.preparethewayint.com. Again, it's www.preparethewayint.com. And you can purchase that on our website. Outstanding. With what we've covered and as the Holy Spirit leads, do me a favor, look into your camera and pray for our audience. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, Lord, that your prophetic people would mm. not be drawn by an obsession with power, but, Lord, mm. they would be drawn into the personality of Jesus Christ. Lord, that they would seek your face in the secret place. And, Lord, that they would become intimate with you. Lord, that out of that intimacy with you, they would find their identity as a son and daughter of God. And out of that place, out of that security of that relationship, Lord, that you would grant them the authority and the power to move as ambassadors of Christ, Father. I pray, God, that you would deliver your people, Lord, Lord, from any uh, prophet or seeking of prophet or the spirit of greed, Father. We just cast down, Lord, the idol of mammon, Father, and we decide in our hearts that we're going to serve the living God. Father, I pray even now for your, those that have been bound by pornography. I pray, God, that as they come to know of your great love and your forgiveness, Lord, that they would pray, Lord, for a hatred for the sin of pornography. Lord, that you would cleanse them, purge them, sanctify them, Lord that they would find that the will of God is their sanctification, that they would abstain from all sexual immorality, and that they would possess their vessel in sanctification and honor. 
not in the passion of lust, Father, but, Lord, that they would walk, Lord, in the Spirit and fulfill your purpose, God, and abstain from all lust of the flesh. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the prophetic people that you've raised up for such a time as this. I pray, God, that you would empower them, excite them, ignite their spirits, God, that they would hear your voice and obey your voice. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Rob, thanks so much thank for Thank you for us. having me. And thank you guys for being with us. Remember, God wants to use you in great and mighty ways. And these pitfalls, they're nothing you need to be afraid of. You simply need to be aware of them. Holy Spirit's ability to lead you in all truth and guide you into all God has for you is much greater than the enemy's ability to trap you or limit you. But we need to be aware of the schemes, the scams, the traps, and the temptations of the enemy so that when Holy Spirit highlights them to us, we're already ready in His strength and by His grace to walk around them and not fall into them. Thank you for being with us. We are excited to hear great testimonies from you how you're growing in the prophetic and growing and being used by God as you become aware of and avoid these pitfalls of the prophetic. We'll see you back here again soon for another Heroes Arise. Ready for more? Go to roberthotchkin.com for more teachings, more resources, and more information about Robert Hodgkin Ministries and men on the front lines.